The keyboard market has been maturing, and we've been seeing increasing competition in the lower price range, which is always great news for newcomers. There's usually one keyboard at a time that holds the budget king position. A couple years back it was the Ann Pro, then maybe the GK line of boards, and I think for the near future, it's going to be the Warmere K66. Priced at around $60 at the time of writing, the Warm packs a ton of features including RGB backlight, RGB underglow, get around hop swap sockets, USB Type-C, thick acrylic plate, correct switch orientation, aftermarket KMK compatibility, and the support of a newly emerging owner's club, the Warmier Gang. The overarching design of the Warm, whether intentional or not, is to get out of the way so that the lights can really shine. The body is three layers of frosted acrylic whose exterior is a painfully simple rectangle. The three layers are distinct with or without the lights on, and the USB port cutout is very large. An interesting thing here is that you don't see exposed hardware from the top of the keyboard. Very often in acrylic cases made by community vendors, you'll see some type of fastener from the top since the screw holes typically go all the way through. On the worm, there are threads on the topmost layer so nothing comes through. This immediately elevates how legit this case's look when compared to the typical acrylic sandwich. Looking from the side, we can see that there's just the slightest of angles offered by the rear rubber feet, which are thicker than usual. The layout is similar to Leopold's FC660M, which leaves a little bit of space between the arrow keys and the insert delete cluster. Through the translucent plastic, we can see the PCB. No complaints there, since there aren't any stray holes. I think when you have exposed surfaces on the top of the keyboard like this, I'm left wanting a high-profile design that envelops the isolated clusters. Without them, they seem a little too barren. I feel this way about TKLs, but that tiny two-key bunch really amplifies this problem. Thankfully, there does exist a higher-profile version of this keyboard called the YC66 available on some AliExpress outlets. This seems to be either the same or extremely close to the unfortunately named Cox Pin Ace, which is only available in Korea. However, note that the bezels don't seem to come all the way up to cover the keycaps. With all that in mind, I think a densely packed 65% layout would have been better for this low-profile design, but this seems to be entirely based on an existing PCB, so that's not possible. So with pretty much nothing in the way of case design, there needs to be something that really grabs your attention, and for the warm, it's RGB. This is the flashiest lighting implementation for any keyboard I've seen yet. Previously, that title went to the Input Club K-Type. What made that board impressive was the inclusion of both in-switch and side-glow RGB LEDs, which was pretty much unheard of at the time. This board does the same thing, but this translucent case makes the effect so much more impressive. The under and side glows blend into each other, creating a very uniform look. When combined with these included shine-through white keycaps, it really makes the board look as if it's surrounded in light. One thing that stands out to me is how dense these underglow LEDs are. They seem to have put them as frequently as they possibly could. You can go watch less boring videos about how to control the lighting, but you have enough options when it comes to choosing colors and effects on board without needing bloated software that gives you unnecessary granularity. One downside of LEDs is that when you have it set to white or any other non-primary solid color, you can easily pick out the components. We'll see why this happens later on. Because this is such a simple lights-focused design, I think you should really keep them on. Some people say it's fun to play with for a couple days and it's done, but I think it's neat when I walk into the room and on my desk is a shiny keyboard. I like the rotating RGB look, as well as keeping it on solid white or solid purple. At first sight, this keyboard is a 66 key layout which was made iconic by Leopold with their FC660 series of keyboards. While it does have 66 keys, the layout is actually not 660. The change comes from just two keys, the right shift and function. While in the 660 layout, these would have been 2.25U and 1.25U respectively, in the warm year, they're 2U and 1U. Because 2U ships are not usually found on cheaper keycap sets, there is an argument to be made that this layout choice was a mistake, but if you're willing to sacrifice having correct legends, which you might considering you only spent $50 or $60 on this, this is actually better than the classic 660. The 660 layout essentially requires you to have two left ships, which is impossible for a standard 104 key key set. However, you can fill the worm with that very key set by using the numpad 0 as the shift and some of the numpad numbers for the bottom row of 1U keycaps. Other than the legends, there wouldn't be much sacrifice since the bottom two rows for profiles like Cherry and OEM are typically the same, so you wouldn't even have a random key sticking out of its row. The same won't be true for something like Sculpted SA, but those tend to be more expensive, so maybe they're not a typical candidate. When I first got this in, I thought the modified layout would be a big complaint, but it seems to make sense in context. Besides, this has a very similar layout to the Ducky 1-2 SF and would actually be compatible with those keycaps. Since Duckies tend to be pretty popular, maybe there will be good aftermarket support for them. Speaking of keycaps, they're arguably the weakest part of the package but even then are not super terrible being ABS of moderate thickness. 
These are pretty much the same ones you get in a gaming keyboard where translucent caps are coated in white and the legends are lasered off. This type of printing is not very durable in my experience. Well before I got into keyboards, I had a cooler master board whose legends started wearing after about 5 months of daily use. You might expect OEM profile for this, but they seem to be SS2, which you see on Leopold keyboards. This is a profile that exists somewhere between Cherry and OEM. The only flaw I found with them is on the right shift, which has a couple textured blobs. I assume this is an uneven application of the white coating or something like that. The keycaps show the correct legends for all of the layers, which is maybe not something you'd expect from a keyboard of this price range. These do seem to be the same ones used in the Cox Pinace. One thing out of the ordinary is that the legends are on the bottom half of the caps rather than the top. This is because the switches are oriented the correct way with the LED facing you. Typical gaming keyboards put the legend on top and rotate the switch 180 degrees to support this. This causes compatibility issues with Cherry Profile keycaps, and honestly, seeing bottom legends on the worm, it doesn't even look bad. I think back in the days of through-hole LEDs, a correctly oriented switch might shine light directly into your eyes, but I don't think that's widely used nowadays, so it's time to retire that legacy. Like I said before, the layout lets you get at least physical compatibility out of very basic sets, and because the GK64 layout has been so popular, I think there are actually a fair number of sets shipping with 2U shifts. Finding replacements for this shouldn't be a big issue. To get any keyboard with these features at this price point, they must have had to cut corners, but aside from the acrylic layer construction, it's actually not that poorly built. The most noticeable flaw are these seams between the layers. They're not flush, so you can definitely feel each one. This isn't a big thing though, since even expensive metal customs seem to have problems dealing with this. I did have an area that was especially bad on the edge under the Z key. It looks like whatever machine was used to cut this slipped up a bit and left a little crooked bump behind. It'd be cool if they assembled the entire thing and sanded the sides down flush, but I assume that drive up the cost immensely. Revisiting that USB port, we see something interesting. To my knowledge, lasers can only go all the way through, but on the port cutouts, we see partway cuts for both the top and bottom pieces. That to me is pretty wild because I've been told that the majority of cost of manufacturing was in machine time, and this would really add to that. Could it be that they did the through cuts on a laser and then moved to a mill? Leave a comment if you have any ideas. Moving on to the bottom, these surprising features continue. These screw holes are counterbore, which is very uncommon in acrylic sandwiches. Switch Couture, who claims to make very high quality acrylic cases, names countersinking as one of the differentiating factors, and his Alice case with a PCB cost me $200, and I can't really say that the case is even double the quality. Undo 14 screws to take the case apart to reveal a very simple construction. The bottom piece, which is about 4.1mm thick, has the counterbore screw holes, as well as the cutouts for the rubber feet and the cutout for the USB port. This is machining on both sides of the acrylic, which I think needs to be done separately. The middle piece at about 3.8mm is a pretty flimsy piece of acrylic that runs the perimeter, and the 4.6mm top is also the plate which has these threaded holes as well as the top USB port cutout. The plate is thick, which poses a problem for MX style switches that require a plate thickness of around 1.5mm to click in. For thick plates to support this, they need two additional shallow cuts for every switch hole like we see in the Rama M60A. The Cox Pinace product page shows these cutouts, but the Warmier doesn't have it. What results are switches that will come out relatively easily. If you're removing the keycaps, the switches will most definitely come out, and you can very easily remove the whole thing with your fingers. This can be a bit of a problem if you intend it to be a travel board. Switches might fall out and get damaged if tossed around in a bag, but it shouldn't be a big issue if you wrap it in a shirt or something. The YC66, which seems to be the same thing as a bare bones version of the Cox Pinace, does seem to have these cutouts. The PCB uses Gateron hot swap sockets and supports this layout only. It has perky SMD RGB LEDs as well as these underglow ones. What's interesting here is that these are side firing, which I've never seen before. This no doubt contributes to the very cool halo effect, but a downside is that the red, green, and blue portions seem to be in line, which is what makes those individual colors easier to see separately. Maybe they were betting on users sticking to constantly changing colors, which will make this harder to notice, and I think that's a fair assumption. The PCB that sports the Cox logo is most likely the priciest part of the board, and seems to be feature-packed. What would really make it perfect for me is if they added holes for PCB mount stabilizers. One side note is that the PCB can be converted to use QMK, courtesy of these people in the Wormier Gang Discord server. I didn't try this since there is a risk of breaking the board, and it doesn't support the side LEDs yet, but it's a great option to have. The worm uses plate mount stabilizers. The included ones are not the best, not the worst. They are not pre-clipped, so you'll want to take care of that. 
I lubed it fairly generously with dielectric grease and it stays okay for a little bit until you spread it out through use. Then it returns to the baseline of a moderately rattly and clicky scent. I got some GMK steps, which did help a bit, but these plate mount ones seem to be a little harder to get quite right when compared to PCB mount ones. Plus with PCB mount ones, you have a lot more decent options. Because plate mount stabilizers are also built for a plate thickness of approximately 1.5mm, you may be concerned that they might not click in, but it seems that the plate does have milled cutouts that allow normal function of these steps. The hot swap functionality is super handy, especially for beginners who want to tinker around with switches to quickly find out what works for them. One thing to note here is that the PCB isn't secured to the case or plate at all, but only secured by the switches themselves. This means that if you pull out all the switches, the PCB is going to rattle around the case a bit. If you start plugging in switches in this state, they will not be fully seated into the PCB, but they will be electrically connected and functional. However, because there may be an impact on sound due to this less secure method, I'd recommend that you disassemble the board and really press the switches in when you're swapping them. This will be especially true for switches that have tight-fitting PCB mount pegs. For the price, this is definitely an impressive level of build quality. I assume there is a lot of savings to be had when going with this material, but they don't cheap out on everything. Seeing them do this for a low price, I would love to see more community acrylic cutters start including some of these features, particularly the threaded screw holes. The worm might have impressive build quality, but there are some more subtle things that I think they should work on within their firmware. As I mentioned before, the community has brought QMK for the board, but it doesn't fully support all the lighting options, so until that's resolved, the stock firmware remains important. When you make your own key layouts, you know what you're going to need, and might end up omitting some keys. For example, I've never used scroll lock or pause in my life, so I leave those out of my QMK key maps. However, when you're producing a fixed key map to be used by thousands of people, you should really aim to include at least all of the keys found on a 10 keyless keyboard. We do have the obvious stuff like the F row on the number row, as well as page up and down, but curiously there is no home or end in any of the layers. I use these keys pretty often when writing scripts and such, so this was weird. Maybe that's not something other people use, but I know print screen is used relatively often, and that's another key entirely absent from the K66. Worst comes to worst, you can open up your on-screen keyboard and press it, but that feels pretty darn unrefined. Considering volume up and down are included, I'm hoping future versions will include these missing keys in one of the layers. In the past, I praised my old full acrylic B-Face for its great typing feel and sound. The construction here is very similar, so I would expect the same for the worm. Being a thick plate with a sandwich construction, there's not really any kind of bounce in the typing feel. Yes, you see the entire case bend when you press down on it, but that isn't something that translates up to your fingers. The bottom out feel is pretty solid, but there seems to be quite a bit of absorption going on. In typical plates and mounting solutions, when you rest your left hand on the keycaps while typing with the right, you'll see some vibration transfer, but here, that's minimal. Because it's plastic, you also don't have to worry about the plate pinging at all. It is still possible to hear ping from your keyboard, but you can be sure that it's your switch springs, which is an issue that can be addressed with lube. Like how the case design gets out of the way for RGB, the case sound gets out of the way for switch sound. The board came with get around blacks which seem to have a bit of upstroke rattle like you find on an unsilenced Topra keyboard. I don't think this is something I would have noticed as readily in a more standard board, so you may want to be more careful when tuning your switches and your stabilizers. Depending on the platform, I've seen these priced in the $50 to $60 range. Most of these will require you to wait for shipping from China or fulfillment by drop, so it won't be the most immediate of gratifications. But I think this is a keyboard worth waiting for because it's so packed with features for such a low price. It was just a couple years ago that addressable RGB for both keys and sides would be entirely unthinkable, 
And it was just a couple years before that, that a mechanical keyboard at this price at all was unthinkable. This is a great example of how far the mechanical keyboard's market has progressed and how much value you can get for a price near the bottom. The stacked acrylic case seems a little less legitimate than injection molded stuff on the surface, but this approach really offers some of the enthusiast benefits in sound and feel that you don't easily find in other pre-builds. This combined with the fact that it's really a complete package with switches and keycaps makes this one of the best bang for your buck keyboards I've seen in a long time. With the stabilizer replacement that you'll probably want to perform, you'll end up with a very nice keyboard for well under $100, which is a win in my book. The YC66 is an option whose case I prefer due to the higher profile bezels, but that's slightly more expensive shipping without switches or keycaps, so that might be closer to the $100 range, which is still fine. Regardless, I think this would be a very competent first keyboard purchase, and I hope to see more like it in the future.